but uh, I have been, uh, I am a professor at, um, you know, say State University of New York, but for the past uh, year and a half, I've been on a leave of absence working at this organization called Peace Tech Lab. And uh, Peace Tech Lab is, let me just quit out of this for a second. So Peace Tech Lab is a nonprofit organization that's housed within the United States Institute of Peace. Uh, so many people might be surprised <laughs> that there is an organization called the United States Institute of Peace. It's a well-kept secret. Um, it's actually a federally funded organization directly funded by Congress. And their mission is, of course, is uh, peace building throughout the world. And some people say, how is that different from the US State Department? The State Department is, well, I won't speak about this administration, but it's supposed to carry out diplomacy. Uh, but USIP, they go in after some peace has been brokered to maintain the peace, for example. That's their role. So our group, Peace Tech Lab, is really focused on how to use data and technology for peace building. And there's some very, very compelling cases nowadays of how data technology has been used very successfully for building peace. Um, just one example I can give you, something I was really impressed with. Um, in the Middle East, you know, in Palestine, Israel, there's so much conflict, right? And it turns out that a lot of conflict was because uh, the peacekeepers or the soldiers, they didn't know which side of the border they were on because the border is not clearly marked everywhere, physically marked. So somebody came up with an application using GPS, mobile technology, and so they mapped out the whole area. So that way, every time, any time a soldier or a peacekeeping person knows which side of the border they're on, that brought down the amount, the number of incidents by 30%, you know, a simple thing like that. So it's just one example of data and technology for, for peace building. So anyway, um, so back to my story. Uh, so about a year and a half ago, I was asked to come and join Peace Tech Lab. They said, you know, uh, we have all these efforts for peace building and technology and so on, but none of these are scalable. And so what we really want is a platform uh, that, that does some predictive analytics. You know, when can there be disruption? This could be used by NGOs, things like that. So I joined a year and a half ago. And uh, since then, we've been working on this platform. And it wasn't a question of just immediately to start building the product. I had to spend a lot of time understanding, first of all, what peace building even means, the difference between peacekeeping, peace building, you know, what was the mission, what kind of data was available, what kind of problems are solvable. Uh, and then there was another aspect to this was, you know, even how to monetize this, right? Because there's a lot of uh, effort and resources that go into building and maintaining a product like this. So that's what I've been working on. Um, at this point, we have a platform. We have launched it. Uh, we have beta customers, including the World Bank. Um, but the interesting thing is it's not just NGOs and those type of organizations who are interested in this. Our product has also attracted the interest of corporations, specifically multinational corporations who require this type of advance warning for their own business operations. So we found a way to monetize this also, which is really interesting. Anyway, uh, that was not <laughs> something that I had uh, expected. I went there more as a technology product person. But anyway, uh, that's also very nice. So that's the background. Um, anyway, uh, so now we can launch into this, now that you know the history of the organization. So just to give you a little bit of uh, uh, an intro in terms of the motivator, why are we doing this? And we talk about the cost of instability. You know, so much uh, money gets spent. They say something like 71.4% uh, of the total GDP at risk is carried by certain cities in emerging economies. So enormous numbers. $13 trillion is the global economic impact of, of unrest. 
And I think people in this country are well aware, aware of these kinds of things, right? So you can have, um, you know, conflict due to civil unrest, social unrest. You could have conflict, instability due to uh, weather and environmental reasons, like the flooding is causing all kinds of problems right now. And you can also have problems due to infrastructure volatility, bridges collapsing, uh, roads not being, you know, properly navigable, things like this. There's so many reasons for these kinds of disruptions. And the interesting uh, observation is that all this kind of instability has a human cost in terms of people, communities, but we also observe that it has a business cost as well. So companies like General Motors or one of the autom automotive manufacturing companies, I think around Chennai a few years ago, because of the floods, they were forced to shut down operations for a month you know, a loss of millions of dollars of productivity. So it, it cuts both ways, right? So the solution that what we're really looking for, and this is something, a slogan that we're, we strongly believe in, that business is good for peace, right? Um, and peace is good for business. So it's, it's a win-win situation. And in fact, a lot of the multinational companies now um, are investing in the communities in which they're actually operating in. So Starbucks, for example, is putting a lot of money into these areas, helping um, you know, places like Colombia, Kenya, where they actually source coffee and so on. Um, why? Because it's in the interest of the community to help them, but it's also in their interest to have stability there. One can take a very cynical attitude and saying that they're just doing it for PR or whatever, um, or one can say that the world is changing and, and you need to have this type of uh, situation. Okay, so anyway, um, so the kinds of people who we are developing this for are, as I said, uh, NGOs, government agencies who are looking to reduce conflict. And if they have early warning, you know, this allows them to uh, properly allocate resources, attract the private sector, etc. For companies like Nestle, Apple, and so on, the primary use case is supply chain disruptions. So anything that could disrupt their supply chain um, is, is what they are particularly interested in or their operations, right? Okay, so that's a little bit of the motivation. So I'm going to talk, I think I talked a little bit about motivation, so now we'll talk about ground truth. This is the name of the platform that we've been developing for early warning. I'll talk to you a little bit about the framework that we've developed around this, um, the kinds of data we use, um, the part on predictive analytics and predicting social unrest. That's the, a little bit of the machine learning piece of it, so you can see what we're doing there. Um, if everything works out, I'll give you a demo um, and talk about some of the new work that we're doing also. Okay, so when we talk about early warning, uh, what do we mean by early warning systems? So early warning can range from minutes. You know, you're given two minutes advance notice of something that's going to happen to something like the two-year advance prediction that this country is extremely stable and that we think that it's going to, it's on the verge of collapse, right? So this is what we mean by early warning systems. And just to give you an example of the, the first one, the minutes, there is a company uh, that we have actually uh, worked with called Hala Systems, and they have used sensors in Syria so that they can, these sensors uh, monitor the sound of aircraft, and so they can identify the kind of aircraft that are coming, approaching, and so they can then provide you early warning of bombing rates, okay? And they give, sometimes they're only able to give a two-minute warning that there's about to be a bombing raid. They can isolate it to within maybe a 10 kilometer area in a location in Syria. But just imagine if you can do that, um, they then blast the warning out on loudspeakers that literally saves lives, right? So it's a great example of technology and how it um, saves lives. Um, what we are focused on is early warning. Sorry, I'm having... Uh, an annoying problem with the, uh, it's on auto uh, display mode, which I forgot to take out. 
But anyway, um, what we are focused on is early warning of days to weeks and, and to months. And the reason why we're focused on this particular time frame is because this is what a lot of the organizations that we are working with, they can use this information to take some action. So if you can give them a few days notice, a few weeks notice, or a few months notice, they can actually take some action to, to prevent that, or at least to mitigate the impact of those kinds of things. So that's sort of the time frame that we're working around. OK, so what is Ground Truth? So it's a SaaS solution, software as a service, providing this early warning of business, economic, social disruption due to volatility in these types of countries. And the countries that we are working on in blue are the countries that we are actively covering right now. And our selection of these countries depends on a few things. First of all, these are countries where there is some volatility, but there's also a lot of economic investment in these countries. There's also a lot of data available in these countries. Right? So these are the kinds of uh, criteria that we used when we started developing the platform. Um, so those are the ones that we're working on now. We're about to add the countries that I'm, I've shown in green, um, because there's also a lot of interest in these countries. You notice that we're not actively working on places like Syria and Iraq and so on. Um, that obviously there's a lot of interest in, in, in those areas. Uh, but it's hard for us. The only people who will fund the work there are the State Department, the U.S. Department of Defense, and so on. There's very little business interest in those types of countries now. Hopefully that will change. So it gives you an idea of the countries we're looking at. So this is sort of the framework that we're using with uh, Ground Truth. So we leverage, uh, let's look at the different risk types here. So what are the kinds of drivers of risk, things that can cause disruption, social un unrest, violent extremism, infrastructure, all of these kinds of things. Um, the kinds of disruptions that we're interested in tracking are on the right-hand side. So how do we get to predicting or anticipating those kinds of disruptions? So that's what the middle section is all about. So these are different kinds of indicators that we're interested in. So things like social issues, labor, telecom, health, all these kinds of things are indicators. These are the kinds of things that could lead to different kinds of disruption. And I'll show you some example. And we are now at a stage where we have enough data, different kinds of data that we can observe in order to uh, collect data related to each of these indicators but more importantly, to quantify these. So we can actually measure, you know, we can take the pulse of a particular city and what's happening in that city with respect to these different indicators. And I'll show you the kinds of data sources that we um, are actually using. So just to give you some examples of uh, these indicators and the power of these indicators, we've actually done a lot of work at Peace Tech Lab uh, in areas like South Sudan, full of violence in this particular region. So there was a major project on identifying hate speech, right? Um, you're familiar with hate speech? And we showed uh, through several experiments that um, hate speech is definitely correlated with violence. So you can, you can actually see a measure, uh, an uptick, uh, especially in the an extreme uptick in the amount of hate speech is correlated with violence. And you can even start to use then uh, that as a predictor uh, of violence. Now, this was in South Sudan, but I think all of you have heard about what's going on in this country with WhatsApp. And you've seen examples of that, how negative speech, hate speech has actually led to violence, right? So this is an indicator. So this is something to, to monitor. And it's not just hate speech. The other kinds of indicators related to social sentiment, so anti-US sentiment, anti-UN sentiment. You can sort of measure all of these. And whenever there's something going on there, whether when you see some abnormal behavior, you can see that that might be 
an early indicator of violence. So this is one example. Using a totally different kind of data, uh, we now have the ability to get a lot of sensor data, which is constantly measuring soil moisture all around, all around the world. And sensor data is really great. The reason why it's great is it's always on, right? So you're always collecting that data, and you can uh, it's much more usable, dependable in that sense. And through this soil moisture data, for example, we can predict, uh, anticipate when there might be pocket drought in certain parts of the country. And this model was a generic soil moisture model that had been developed. And now this model is being refined so that you can adapt it to specific crops, for example. So, you know, uh, rice, uh, coffee, tobacco, each one of them has their own reactions. So you can have specialized mo uh, models. Now, who is interested in this? <laughs> A lot of organizations. So the World Bank is very interested in this because this can, uh, by knowing this kind of inf information, they can anticipate when there might be uh, refugee, uh, you know, sudden, uh, you know, explosion of refugees from one area to another if they know that some drought is about to happen. It is also used by businesses for supply chain disruption. So in Colombia, many of these areas are coffee growing areas. So it also gives companies like Nestle and Starbucks early warning of potential supply chain. Pardon? About two months. This is about two months. It's a great question. So different types of disruption, uh, like something like social unrest, which I'll show you, we can predict on the order of a few days ahead of time. But some of this type of data, you can do longer range. You can do two months uh, uh, prediction. And depending on what you need it for, you know, the time window uh, varies also. So another example. Um, this is another example of... Uh, these types of things and how it's correlated with violence. This came from our own product, so we were uh, monitoring the situation this time in Pakistan, and it shows something that you would think is fairly obvious, but the data definitely shows this. This is showing the Sindh province in 2017, and the blue curve shows the amount of rainfall, and the dotted yellow line shows the number of protests, right, especially violent protests that are taking place there. And you can see when there's a dip in the, you know, sudden drop in the amount of rainfall, there's a sudden spike in the amount of protests also. So you can actually see this um, through data. So sometimes these data, uh, they tell you things that you already know, but it's still important to show this through data when you're trying to make a case to government officials and so on. You know, just arguing with them sometimes isn't useful, but if you're able to present data like this and show it to them, they're sort of forced to take action. So there's, there's, there's still a good reason for doing this. Um, and again, same thing in 2018. Okay, so, so ground truth, uh, we present dashboards, which hopefully I get to show you. And these are the kinds of things that we're doing, we, different dashboards. One is alerts, so these are actual predictions. When and where there could be protests, strikes, along with some audit trail that explains why the prediction was made. Okay? The second thing are actual disruptions. So these are actual instances of organizations, cities suffering major kind of disruptions. So for example, Mumbai was shut down, parts of Mumbai were shut down, so that would count as a disruption. And the indicators are these different variables, environment, regulatory, social unrest, on a scale of 1 to 10 every week, what is the health of a particular city? And this also we, we try and automate uh, through the data that we actually get here. So just to give you some examples, so this is a predictive alert. So in this case, this is uh, in Argentina, there's been a prediction of a protest on February 8th near the National Bank related to uh, wage complaints and so on, it says violence is not anticipated. So this is the kind of output that we're trying to produce from the predictive analytics algorithm. 
and the further information talks about who are the major actors so some explanation further explanation as to why they think uh, we think this is going to happen so that's one of the key outputs um, that ground truth produces these kinds of uh, alerts and we're trying to the more data we suck in the more kinds of alerts we can produce so this is a lot of this is based on social media data but using sensor data, we would be able to produce different types of alerts. And we're beginning to roll in more and more of these kinds of data sources. I'll, get, I'll show you all the data that we're, we're, we're look, we've looked at. And there's cost associated with data. I'll, I'll come to that in a second. So this was actually a validated example. So we predicted something. Uh, that there would be some protest on government policies, and that was actually validated by the next day's news. So our slogan is that we want to, you know, see the events before the news actually, before it becomes news, right? So that, that's what we're actually trying to do here. And uh, so this is a part, I'll, I'll show you how we do this uh, in a few minutes. Um, so these are different kinds of disruptions. So these are actual disruptions that we're tracking. And each of the disruptions, we try and categorize them. Is it infrastructure? Is it supply chain? Um, you know, how is this going to impact an organization? And I'll show you this when we um, produce the demo. And finally, the stress indicators. So this is a particular city. This could be Bogota. Each of these curves represents um, the stress related to a particular indicator. The indicator we have here, the red is extremism and conflict, yellow is crime, blue is infrastructure, green is social unrest. So on a scale from one to 10, on a weekly basis, we try and measure uh, this, the amount of stress associated with each of those indicators. So we have been able to automate um, the quantification of the indicator. So we'll be able to automatically figure out on a scale of one to 10, what should it be from week to week? Um, what we are doing is we have, working in the organization I do, we have a lot of people who are really experts in these countries. So they're able to provide commentary and give some explanations as to why something suddenly jumped, <clears throat> jumped from a four to an eight or started coming down and so on. So this dashboard has been, the World Bank people especially found this to be particularly interesting. Um, and you can go back and look at historicals. And the really interesting thing is, if you look at this, it correlates well with certain political events also. When a ceasefire happened, you know, when it expired, you can actually see the uptick in certain things. So uh, we're pretty happy with this in terms of what we've done in terms of automating the quantification. I think we still have more work to do in terms of trying to automate the explanation. Okay, right now we're using analysts. Um, by the way, that's been one of my major challenges this past year and a half. The people I work with, um, there are no computer scientists, except for a few of my graduate students who are working with me. All of them are social scientists, um, or people who have extensive training in conflict, uh, conflict resolution. So one of my challenges was, how do I take these extremely smart people and use them in terms of producing data for the product? And actually, it's been very successful because they're experts in coming up with taxonomies. This is how we categorize things. So they develop the taxonomy uh, when we have to develop uh, initial lexicons for classifiers, right? How do you classify data that's related to social unrest in Bogota versus New Delhi, right? So they're able to come up with some really good seed lexicons and, and help us uh, train those classifiers. And they also provide this expert commentary. And we figured out a way of you know, getting them to do their work, enter it in so it automatically gets ingested into the product. So this is uh, ground truth is part automation, part human analysis. And I think for something like this, you actually do need both. Okay, so somebody asked about the data. Uh, 
So ground truth leverages the complete data landscape. So whatever data we can get our hands on, we try and use. Obviously, there are cost uh, issues related to the data. So we are looking at which of these data sources gives us the most benefit in terms of predictive power and so on. So obviously, we use social media data, the sensor data. Uh, from AWARE is really good for agricultural, the soil moisture and so on. Um, we're trying to get traffic data from Waze and other places also because that tells us about potential disruptions in the roads, that if there's nothing happening on a particular highway, tells us that there's something going on there. Uh, we have, you know, uh, lots of partnerships with specific countries uh, that give us some uh, you know, uh, media related, that's very local media as opposed to New York Times and all of those. We use uh, conflict databases. Um, ACLID is one that we use, which I'll talk about in a couple of minutes, as well as periodic indices like the World Bank and all of that. They give lots of macroeconomic data. So a lot of these data sources. But what's really interesting, yes? Yes? Yeah. Yeah. So we have different ingestion capabilities. So we've, the whole thing is built. Uh, AWS has helped us actually uh, build some of this. So they have an ingest pipeline. And different kinds of data have different ingestion uh, criteria. So uh, they've helped us uh, build that. What we're trying to do is we're, we still have a lot of work to do on the back end in terms of uh, scaling up, especially with the sensor data, which is really real time. So we're just sampling it, uh, you know, much more sparsely than the data is current, uh, than the data is actually available. But uh, AWS has some really good platforms to handle that kind of uh, uh, sensor data ingestion. So each, you're right, every, every new data source that we add, we have to think about, you know, how do we ingest the data? Um, and, and how do we actually and incorporate that into classification, quantification, prediction, those three tasks? Yes, yes, yeah. So there's a lot. This is why what we've done is we've experimented with some of the data sources one by one offline. So we know what kind of information we get from it. And now in the real-time platform as we roll it out, we are bringing in the data sources that, as I said, that first of all are most cost effective and also give us the most predictive power. So the data sources we have right now, social media, news, we have air quality data from all over the world. This is sensor data. Really good data, by the way, um, uh, for, and it covers India also. And not only, I was amazed, when you look at the air quality data, it's not just Bangalore. You can zero in on neighborhoods of Bangalore and see the different air quality data. So that's really useful, actually, uh, in prediction. What we have not included right now is uh, the satellite data. Is First of all, it's expensive, and it's the processing of the data is also pretty challenging to do change detection and so on. So that will come as we need it. Yes. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Um, and there's no doubt that uh, social media, and there's one other data source, which I'm going to talk about, is local data. Very, very valuable. So what do we mean by local data? We mean data that's sourced locally. Okay, so examples, it could be food prices. So we actually gathered data in Egypt, in Cairo. We monitored for several months. We asked people to give us Here's a list of basic staple goods, you know, bread, wheat, so on, not bread, wheat, rice, uh, cooking fuel, and so on. Uh, <clears throat> so that kind of data they can give us, um, air quality, so on. It could be qualitative. It could be opinions, commentary, situational reports, things like that. Uh, in Kenya, we had some proprietary data. So during the elections, uh, we had actually set up our own SMS platform so that people could report things that were happening due to the elections. And so this 
SMS data was also something that we were uh, able to leverage. Uh, I'm going to come back to this local data collection, hopefully in, in a few minutes, because I think uh, there's something we're doing here which is really exciting. Uh, it's in the early stages. We believe that this is, what we really want to do is crowdsource local data, right? And there are lots of challenges in crowdsourcing local data. It's more than just building an app and releasing it. You have to incentivize people to collect the local data, right? You have to validate the data. Is this accurate or not? And you also have to protect people who are contributing sensitive data. Can you imagine if you launched an app, even in Bangalore, asking people to report on incidents of corruption? Everybody knows it. it most people have paid a bribe. So there are sites like I, I paid a bribe or whatever. But to do this on a massive scale throughout the globe requires some, some, some real thinking. And I'll show you what uh, we're planning on that front. Uh, <clears throat> AWS has some uh, really nice tools to do automatically uh, tag data now, pictures with, uh, forget the name of it. Google has uh, one, and AWS also recently launched one. So basically, they can take video and images and do some basic annotation of keywords. And that's useful when, when pulling up relevant images or classifying and so on. We haven't done as much as we'd like to. Again, it's not because of any shortage of ideas. It's just because of resource issues here. Um, I could use a team of 30 people, uh, you know, computer scientists working on this, in addition to all the other people that I have. OK, um, so let's talk a little bit about the, the predictive uh, piece of this, this uh, predicting social unrest. So this is work that I, my, I was doing with one of my students, uh, Lu Meng. She's a doctoral student. And the task, this task was actually originally defined by IARPA, which is uh, the intelligence version of DARPA. So they had actually run a competition a few years ago. Um, and so they actually defined this task. But we found it to be very interesting. So it's uh, predict on which date and in which city protests, riots could happen. Um, and you also have to say whether it's going to be violent or nonviolent. You have to provide an audit trail, which means what sources of information did you use in order to make this prediction. Um, there was not a summarization component, but that's what we're looking at. Um, and applicable to numerous countries and languages. So when IARPA uh, announced this as a task a few years ago, they distributed some data sets to the competitors to actually work on. Most of those data sets are stale. Uh, and I'll explain you know, why we abandoned any of that and chose to do our own thing. So here's an example of a successful effort. So if the algorithm, if the model works correctly, you should be able to say, our algorithm predicts there'll be a large protest on this date in Bolivar Square. And the reason, because uh, thousands of Colombians opposed to somebody, whatever, and some additional information. And also pulling out relevant you know, previous um, you know, alerts that happened uh, in the past and doing some summarization and so on. So this is the kind of output that you would expect from a model like this. So in order to do this, um, OK, here's, so, so here's some related work. The related work sort of is in two buckets. The first one is sort of what the social scientists and people working in that area using macroeconomic data, they, they came up with some, uh, they've come up with some similar kinds of techniques. Um, the problem is that their predictions are on a yearly basis, and they use, in my opinion, stale data. In my opinion, anything more than a week old is stale data. So a lot of the macroeconomic data is unfortunately falls into that category. The real-time data, there was a group at the University of Virginia who actually won the IARPA competition. Um, they published, um, and we worked with them for a while. Um, and I'll say this in this room, please don't repeat. We were not very happy with it. <laughs> Uh, what they were getting. I think what happened was they did well in the IARPA competition 
on the data sets which were given and the evaluation data sets. But this kind of a problem is very sensitive to time. You know, things change. The world changes. You know, what, what's true this week is not true next week, right? So you need fresh data uh, for, for training and evaluation on this. So we chose to do this differently. Um, so one of the data sets that we leveraged is called ACLID. Um, this is armed conflict and event data. Um, it's a really great data set. And this is updated manually by hundreds of volunteers all over the world who have been trained in how to code various events that, that happen, right? And they have extensive coverage in Africa, but recently, for the past few months, they've just added a whole bunch of countries in Asia, including India, Pakistan, Indonesia, several of these countries. So uh, they uh, collect data like this. So for example, they give you the date, the event type, um, which actor was involved, uh, the country, the city. They give you the city. And then they give you an explanation also of the actual event. Now, this data is, um, uh, for Africa, it's available for 12 years. For Asia, obviously, it's available only for the past few months. Um, and it's really great, except it has a one-week lag, which means that because it's being updated manually, it's one week sort of behind. So your prediction models have to take that into account that they're looking at data that's a week old, right? Um, so, so this is um, a, a great uh, data source. And we use this rather than any of the data that IARPA provided um, because we're able to train on it. And more importantly, we're also able to evaluate um, on this data. So, so that's what we're using. Uh, we started off with a historical model that is just using what happened in the past, can you predict the future, right? So simple historical model using only ACLID data. And we use some simple features. Um, uh, the number of events that happened in the same city in the previous two weeks. And the intuition is if there's been a lot of unrest in the past two weeks, you know, there might, that probably means that it's continuing. And also the event continuity in the past two days, three days, was, was there some event also. So this is a graph. This just shows you some of the ACLID data. This is for Cairo. This is two months of data for Cairo. So each of the dots represents a day, okay? So you have about 60 dots here. Um, and what we're showing is, on the x-axis, we're showing the event count, which is um, hum on days on which um, the number of events that happened in that city in the previous two weeks. So something like this means, um, a blue dot here means that this is a day on which five events happened in the previous two weeks, right? Um, so relatively peaceful kind of conditions. And the blue means that on that particular day, no event took place on that particular day. A red dot means that there was something that happened that day, right? So this sort of makes sense. You know, there's very low event count and relatively nothing happens. You can see some anomalies on the right-hand side. Those are two blue dots which means that no event happened that day, even though there was a lot of events that happened in the previous two weeks, right? So why does that happen? That could be because of a ceasefire. It could be of some resolution of conflict, right? So, so this is the kind of data you get from ACLID, which is pretty interesting. So based on uh, this data, we trained a pure historical model we tried out various uh, methods here, and we ended up using the SVM model to perform the best. And one of the um, nice things about the uh, SVM model, we had to establish a threshold so that we could predict whether we think on this day there is going to be something or not. Um, and with the SVM model, you're able to use the distance to the hyperplane to establish that threshold. And that varies from city to city. So this has to be trained uh, for each city. You have to train it differently, right, uh, to pick out different thresholds. 
But then just using historical data alone is not satisfying. Um, there are a lot of countries where we don't have this data. So we wanted to use the dynamic data, the real-time data. So this is where we started incorporating the historical plus the Twitter uh, metadata. So what we do is, in addition to the historical uh, data, we also bring in uh, uh, Twitter data. So we, for example, if you're doing predictions for Cairo, you bring in all the tweets from Cairo on for that particular week or whatever window you're trying to predict, uh, filter it to a 50-mile radius surrounding that city of interest. And then we had to train classifiers that pulled in only those tweets that were related to social unrest, labor, infrastructure, anything like these kinds of topics that could sort of be related to you know, protests and conflict and so on. And we extracted some features from this, the change of daily counts, the average tone, and the topic intensity as well. Right? So these were the simple features that we had uh, extracted. Once again, we ran this through uh, uh, different machine learning models, and again, ended, um, ended up selecting uh, the SVM. So uh, we have some preliminary results. A lot of this is still being worked on. The eval evaluation metric that we used, accuracy, was what IARPA suggested as an evaluation metric. The reason being is if you use a very uh, strict, stringent evaluation metric, you have 30 days in a month or 31 days in a month. That means on each day you would have to check, did you predict something? Did it, act, did it actually occur, right? That's pretty tough, right? The reason being, for most of the cities, nothing happens, you know? So out of 30 days, maybe there's one or two days when something actually happens. So using that kind of a very stringent evaluation metric is really tough. So accuracy is something that IARPA dis defined. So basically, they uh, control the denominator. They said uh, the denominator is the days when events happened plus randomly selected same number of days when no event happened, just to sort of balance it out. And you can see some of the results that we're getting here, which is not too bad. Actually, we, we outperformed the initial IARPA competition results fairly quickly. Uh, by using some newer methods. And so on the accuracy level, we're getting not bad results. We're trying to improve it. Uh, but what we're trying to do now is evaluate slightly differently, and that is look at a window. So if our prediction says that something is going to happen on the 18th, we look at a three-day window, 17th, 18th, 19th, to see whether something actually happened. We think that's more fair, right? A fairer way of prediction. We're also trying to increase um, it, the horizon. That is, right now, we're only able to predict a few days in advance. We're trying to see if we can extend out. Can we predict more like a week, eight days, nine days in advance? So that's some of the ongoing work that we're doing. Um, so let me just talk a little bit about some of these. The next thing that we're doing, this is what Lou is working on. Uh, you've heard all the great lectures on deep learning. This is a perfect place to use deep learning. Um, so right now we're using, you know, selecting certain features, but really not using the content of the tweets. We're just using metadata. By using some of the deep learning models, we actually want to use the content of the tweet itself um, in this particular case to see if it makes a difference. And the other thing is that we can also incorporate all kinds of additional features, like maybe uh, maybe the temperature on that particular day. Hot days, people go more crazy or whatever, right? So you can incorporate all kinds of other features as well in, in some of these models, food prices, things like that. So this is what she's currently working on. Um, we've started some of this work, you know, in terms of using word to vec and word embeddings to start coding this. And this is where we can actually start bringing in some of the additional features like temperature. One of the other things we think is, is important is day of the week, right? So for some countries, maybe Saturday, Sunday. For other countries, it might be Friday, Saturday, things like that. So we're trying to bring that also in. 
um, and bring in additional sources. So this is an opportunity to also bring additional uh, non-social media data also into the picture. Um, that's what, what deep learning would allow us to do. So very excited about that. I'm going to uh, have just a couple of slides. So I, I told you I was going to talk about local data collection platform. This is our biggest challenge, is how to do this sourcing of local data. Can you imagine? I mean, you have all these 50 countries. We want to cover at least 10 major cities in each of these countries. And in order to do data collection and aggregation, you need quite a few data samples, which means you need a lot of people collecting this data. So I already mentioned that you know, we want to do this using a you know, crowdsource method, mobile app, and so on. But we had to figure out a way of doing this properly. That is, um, how do you get people incentivized to contribute data? How do you algorithmically validate whether the data is correct or not? How do you protect people's identities from when, you know, so that there's no retaliation against them? These are all challenges that we had to face. So I had a chance meeting. Uh, I was talking about this problem with someone who uh, works for another organization called Consensus. You've heard of them. They're one of the leading blockchain uh, providers. So we came up <laughs> with a solution, which uh, now DARPA is interested in helping us uh, prototype and develop. Uh, we're calling it Ways for Social Disruption. Ways is you know finding your, navigating your way around, right, in craziness. So this is something similar. So the idea here is to use blockchain, because blockchain uh, can help with some of these issues, uh, incentivization, data validation through smart contracts and so on, and through digital identities, even protecting identities of people and so on. Uh, so the idea is um, that we need to partner with existing networks in order to do this, OK? The hardest part about data collection is uh, finding networks of people who are willing to contribute data, right? So the idea was, why not tap into some existing networks? So what existing networks? Well, we have our own local peace builders we can talk to. But the best existing networks are some of these platforms that are already out there. Ola, Uber, Didi. Um, what is the, uh, the, the timeshare one, um, uh, the Airbnb, all these kinds of organizations, they already have networks, right? So the drivers already have apps that they're using. And if you think about it, um, who knows best what's happening in a city is usually the drivers, <laughs> right? So, so this is where we got this idea of, of uh, tapping into networks like this. So we're in some preliminary conversations now. And, and Starbucks also has expressed an interest in, in possibly partnering with us on this. And again, think about Starbucks. They have locations all around the world. And when their people are not serving coffee and they have things to do, you know, they might want to do data, something like this. Uh, using blockchain, you, know, you, you have a system incentivization uh, vehicle already set up, right? And so if you contribute data, you can reward them by tokens. And the tokens could be re redeemed for you know, ride share credits, actual currency. For those people who want Bitcoin, I guess they could use that too. But it, one should not confuse blockchain with cryptocurrency though, right? We're just using blockchain as, as the, the platform. So, so this is the idea. So we know what kind of data we need to collect. So we need to know today in Delhi, for example, let's say you're tracking something related to violence against women, which is horrible, especially in that city, right? So you need uh, data reporting on that. So our system knows where it needs data and what kind of data it needs. We send out a broadcast. So this gets broadcast to the network of partners, um, and people can, just like Uber, decide to pick up a ride. They can decide whether they want to answer this question. 
and they can accumulate credits and so on. We even thought, of, thought about taxi drivers, for example, even asking their uh, passengers or whatever. That's another system. Um, we need to validate the data so that the same kind of information, we need at least three people validating that, and that can be done through the smart contracts and so on. Everyone has digital identities, so their identities are protected. We also talked about, in certain countries, having the app completely disappear from their phone just in case somebody comes and, you know, threatens them, what are you doing? So all these kinds of protection mechanisms. So the this is pretty excited about this effort. Um, it's, <laughs> it's a big lift. Uh, DARPA is interested in helping us. Um, so we want to pilot this in a few countries, few cities first. And we have to test various things, including uh, how, uh, how to incentivize people to report data. This is where some of the game theory might come. And sometimes it's non-monetary. So people uh, don't necessarily need to be paid money. Suppose you could give them some information in return that's very valuable to them, right? That might be even more valuable than, than money. That's why using tokens as a basis is really nice, because we can decide how to, to act upon that. So this is some uh, new work, and hopefully in, if I get an opportunity to talk to you in a year or so, I can report on how this is going, but um, some interesting uh, work. So I think I'm just going to conclude on this note. Um, so multidisciplinary team working on this to create the solution. I already talked about peace is good for business. Need to, we need to do a lot more work in terms of scaling this up. Um, and this is my own belief that AI and technology will see their greatest impact in social good. Um, I, you know, I've worked on projects where you use Netflix data to try and recommend movies and all that. I said, you know what, you need to use all this advanced technology for something bigger than just recommending movies, right? So this is the time to do that. So hopefully all of you will be part of the journey. Thanks. Yeah, so we're not, uh, we're looking at soil moisture data and all that kind of thing, right? So we're not trying to predict whether it's going to rain or not or whatever. We're just looking at the actual soil moisture data. So it's a little bit different. So our goal is not to predict um, whether it's going to rain or not. We leave that to different kinds of experts. So we're looking at things that could, that why, it has to be information that's actionable, that people could react to. Yeah. If I told you it's going to rain tomorrow, the best thing you could do is, you know, hold an umbrella. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we've experimented with all of them, and some of it is pragmatic also in terms of the customers we're working with, what do they want to see most. Right now, we're seeing the most interest in uh, supply chain issues. Um, and supply chain issues can also vary. If you're someone like oil and gas company and you're looking at supply chain issues, um, they've solved that problem. Exxon. Uh, has 1,500 people in Nigeria alone just reporting on anything that could disrupt the oil pipeline. So that's not something that we need a technology solution for. But if you look at other types of, you know, like uh, food and beverage, you know, coffee, tea, water bottling, Pepsi, for example, has bottling plants all over the world, including South India. Uh, they have bottling plants. And there's all these water disputes going on. So if the people who are protesting 
that they don't have water see that a big company like Pepsi is able to draw water because they have deeper wells, you know, it's, they, they'll try and retaliate. Now, if Pepsi knew a few days in advance that something like this is going to happen, that's an opportunity for them to act by providing water tankers to diffuse the situation. Okay, so that's why I'm saying it's an example of why a company would try and do something to help the situation because it helps the local people, but it also helps themselves. Because in other places, they would have had to shut down. That's what actually happened in Mexico. Uh, they had to shut down their operations. So it's a little pragmatic. Yeah. You know, this is like boiling the ocean, trying to do everything. So we're trying to do what we can. Um, the garment industry also uh, is very, very susceptible to supply chain. And that usually is sourced from where? Vietnam, Bangladesh, all these places. And they have the companies who are sourcing that have no visibility into what's going on there. So that's what we're actually providing. Um, the other one would be, of course, uh, manufacturing and uh, electronics industry. That one is heavily based in China, and it's pretty tough to get data out of China. So. Yeah. That's, uh, that question has come up many times uh, different ways. One is, uh, first question they ask is, can your product be used by people who have, you know, nefarious <laughs> objective, that is, they want to suppress protests or whatever? So my answer is um, yes, but those people who really want to do something bad like that already have access to that information somehow. This actually levels the playing field, so it makes that data available to everybody else. In terms of gaming the system, that's why we want to use the blockchain. So you cannot prevent people from contributing bad data, but you can disincentivize them. Because if there's not enough validation or whatever, you know, at some point, their reputation goes down in terms of a data contributor and so on. So technology can't solve everything, but it can certainly help. So the idea is to incentivize people to contribute good data, but to disincentivize people from contributing negative data. So that's why I'm saying it's an experiment. We think that you know the smart contracts might be helpful, but this is where some game theory stuff, I think, is, is definitely going to be useful. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right now we're not looking at a lot of that. So we haven't entered the territory of, you know, fake news and, and all of those kinds of things. Definitely that, that's a part of this that at some point we would want to do, but we're not looking at that right now. Yeah. But could be, uh, I think for the data collection, maybe that's something we would want to do. Um, but again, there, you know, you're using digital identities and all that, so you don't know exactly who, but you have to figure out some other way that there's something going on here. <laughs> uh, we, we, we've actually conducted some workshops where we have people who are, uh, you know, people from academia, uh, Georgetown University, we have a lot of people from there actually trying to use it. Um, we will definitely try and make it available to you. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I think I'm running out of time. I, I, I want, you know, I wanted to show you the demo. The problem is that the resolution is terrible. Um, but this is sort of it just looks horrible <laughs> on this particular view. Let me see. Uh, let's see if this works. Uh, not much. Yeah. So this is what it sort of looks like. And what I was going to show you, for example, uh, let's see if this works. Actually, just even before I do that. Um, um, what we're showing here is the heat map, right? The global heat map. So the blue is the disruptions. So if I click this to heat, 
you can see this is where a lot of disruptions are occurring in the places. This is all real-time data, right? So this is where a lot of the disruptions are actually occurring. These are where we have predictions. This is media information and so on. So I was about to show you something that we are tracking for supply chain issues. And this is in Vietnam. This is frozen. Oh, I'm not able to show this. Uh, there's something going on with screen resolution. Okay, let me just show you some some data that's happening here. Yeah, it's very slow. See, it's refreshing the data. Just coming up. Normally, it's much snappier than that. Let's just take a look at what kind of disruptions are happening. So these are all disruptions that we're tracking in India, um, and you can there's some that are interest uh, particular interest here. Um, I think this is a supply chain. You can just track this one. Yeah, to protest against buses skipping a stop and so on. So you might say, why is this of interest that there's going to be protest and um, protest and stopping buses and so on. This could, uh, this is an indicator of some possible disruption, right? If you don't have buses, that means things are going to come to a halt. People cannot come to work, whatever. So it's an early indicator of, of some sort of disruption. Um, I wanted to show you something more, but uh, for some reason this isn't snappy enough on this particular display. Um, for those of you who are really interested, I can. I'd rather unplug this and just show it to you offline, if you don't mind. Um, yeah, there was some nice, uh, let me see what else here. I'll try one more thing. So we'll go back to the global view. And I think I saw some interesting information in Russia, hopefully. Um, yeah, it's, the screen is doing something weird here. Oh, okay, let's see. So yeah, this is Russia, and these are some predictions, um, things that could go wrong. And for example, this is July 18th. So this was not a prediction. This is what we call an extracted um, Prediction. So sometimes you predict something that will happen. In some cases, it's just announced. So that's more of an information extraction task. So that we found it here. So July 18, something big is going to be happening. Um, massive protest in Moscow and so on. So you might say that, well, you know, if it's announced, then people already know this. But, you know, you're a multinational corporation. You're dealing with 50 countries, so many cities. You need something that pulls all of this information together. So even though something is announced here, you actually get to see it, right? So the idea is that you can immediately have the information at your fingertips. And sometimes people who are in the countries who know things are going on are disincentivized to report uh, to other people. Why? Because you know their plant might get down, shut down, they might lose their job. This provides all that full visibility. So I think I'm going to, if anybody really wants to see this, I will try and show it to you offline. Um, but if not, I can even schedule a demo uh, online, and we can walk through a complete demo for you. And yes, we'd be happy to have you try it out. <laughs> OK, thank you. new economy. It can create a new economy for those people who are 
and losing jobs through automation. Uh, I view that data provide, you know, people can take on a new role and earn some, some money that way. Yeah. Thank you.